You're welcome. If it's all right with our speakers, I think we might go ahead and get started. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for everybody to um, hear from, from everyone, our, our big panel tonight. So I want to first thank by welcoming everyone tonight. It's so good to see all of you here for Artist Papers, Building Legacy 3 Archives. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs here at PAPA. And I want to start today how I start most of our programs, which is a huge thank you to all of our members who are here on the call. Um, thank you all for coming out and supporting us today and every day. I see many recognizable faces. Um, so thanks to everybody for being here. And if you haven't already, please consider joining. Um, I always start, Papa Pours is one of my favorite programs to facilitate. And I always start, start by saying cheers to all of you. Um, welcome again to another one. Cheers. cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and before we get started, I know many of you have been to programs before. Um, you know that I have a quick Zoom spiel to get through, but for any newbies on the call, just quickly how we're going to facilitate today. So I'm going to start off by muting everybody. Um, my speakers, please unmute yourselves. Um, so I just went ahead and muted everyone, and that's just because Zoom likes to assume it knows who the speaker is. Um, so if you have a chatty cat, it's going to think that you are our archivist tonight, and so we'd like for that not to happen. That doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you today. We really do. Um, there's a few different ways that we would like to hear from you. The first being our chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and start that real quick. Um, also drop in a membership link while I'm here. So feel free during the program, if you have questions as we go, if you have thoughts, if you have links, this is a great resource to share. Um, we are going to be our speakers today have a wonderful PowerPoint. They're going to be showing you beautiful images of the John Roden Archive. Um, but we will open it up for more conversation towards the end of the program. But while they're speaking, feel free again to use the chat. Um, once we open it up for Q&A, if you'd like to virtually raise your hand, that's how we've asked to call on you. And so the way you do that is if you click on where it says participants at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, on the right hand side, it'll say raise hand. So when you do that, I and our speakers can see you, we'll call on you and unmute you that way. Because um, again, we do want to hear, this is a conversation, so we want to hear from you. Um, other than that, next to that little mute button that you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a camera button. Um, I mentioned that because if you can't see yourself on screen and you want to, feel free to click that. Um, I also mentioned it because we are recording tonight's event. We put all of our pop -up programs uh, on Zoom on our YouTube channel one or two days after the event is over. So. If you'd like to not be on the recording, feel free to mute your camera that way. You also probably won't unless you're actively speaking, but just in case that makes you something you want to know about. Um, and I'll drop a link to that archive on our YouTube channel in just a few minutes um, as well. Other than that, um, we are, if you want to pin one of our speakers, go ahead. Or actually, I'm going to ask if each of our speakers can just say hi real quick so you can see everybody, since we do have a nice big group with us tonight. Um, you guys want to just say hi. 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 And so now that you see them, I'm going to actually introduce them so you know who I'm talking about. Um, here with us tonight, we have Wang Tran, the director of the archives, Dr. Brittany Webb, the curator of the John Roden collection. And from our NEH grant funded John Roden archive project, we have Jana Arbach and Kaylin Baldridge. So welcome to the four of you. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Brittany. Yeah. Um, so I guess since we're all going to be uh, talking, folks can go into speaker view or pin video because Zoom will uh, sort of jump around and highlight whoever's talking. Um, I think it's fun to get to talk about archives and artist papers. This is such a behind the scenes how your exhibition gets made look. Um, in a way that we don't normally get to do and people don't think about how it's really hard to make an exhibition without archives. And so getting to highlight the work that folks are doing with the archives at PAFA is sort of exciting. Um, and I see a lot of archivists on the call or people who work in historic libraries or research institutions. Um, welcome, thank you so much. I. Um, if I can take some license to speak on behalf of curators in all museums, we cannot do the things that we want to do without you all behind the scenes doing the work that you do and you don't get thanked enough for that. Um, so really a toast to you. Cheers to all of you. Um, and then let's get started talking a little bit about how we're, you know, making making archives at the at, at with the John Roden papers at PAFA. Um, 
And so I want to show a few visuals just to start. Okay, are we good? Great. Um, so I thought we'd start with um, these photos. These are some of my favorite images of John Roden in the archives. Um, just to think a bit about how archives work, how artist papers build legacies, what is an archive and how do you make one? What are artist papers? What are in them? And why is that valuable? Um, I also want to thank all of the members that have joined us for this program. Um, we really can't do what we do without you and we re appreciate your support, um, especially now that we're all socially distancing and some of us have been in quarantine. Um, we've really come to appreciate still being, to, being able to connect with our audiences and feel supported by them. Um, we thought we'd start by introducing PAFA's Center for the Study of the American Artists, which is where all this work takes place. Um, so Wang, if you wanted to speak a little bit about what the Center for the Study of the American Artist is um, and sure. what you do there. Sure, again, my name is Wang Tran, Director of the Archives here at PAFA. Uh, my main role is to oversee the historical records for the institution, which includes the school as well as the museum records. Um, we're talking about student files, uh, exhibition related records, photography, things like that uh, to tell the historic narrative of PAFA since 1805 to the present. Uh, we also have very important manuscript collections for artists and art organizations associated with PAFA, but specifically for today, um, we wanted to talk about the power archives and the ability to build and support an artist's legacy. Um, as Brittany mentioned, the John Roden paper will be the example that we're using for tonight um, around securing his um, legacy and what the museum professionals such as myself, Kellen, John, and Brittany do and how we work and collaborate and synthesize for something um, such a very large project, especially because Brittany is in charge of the exhibition as well as the pending catalog that's coming up. Um, yeah, so. So a lot of people um, that aren't familiar with archives, I may use archives and papers interchangeably. Um, they wonder why uh, it's so important or why it's valuable. Old documents for photography as well as personal artifacts. They may not have monetary value. However, they are very important for historical and research value. A lot of artist papers play a crucial role in providing important contextual information to support scholars conducting the research. For instance, um, this example for tonight will be about John Roden. Um, the, the papers um, provide behind the scenes look into the mind of the artist, I believe, illuminating personal details about their life and influence that um, impacted their creative process. Uh, in more pragmatic terms, uh, archives ensure the details of the artists are uh, documented and Correct. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we found was locating John Roden's birth date. Um, there was a discrepancy between even the Library of Congress and World Catalog. Um, I think it was 1916, but we believe it's 1918 or vice versa. Brittany, you can confirm that. <laughs> but overall, um, just getting a sense when we Googled John Roden, there was literally not that many uh, archives that had a ton of information about him. Um, Smithsonian had probably one of the bigger uh, collections about his life, uh, documenting his artwork, uh, a very important oral history, I believe, as well, that we'll mention through this. Um, together, it all just ensures the historical record is accurate. Um, so when researchers look back 10, 15, even 100 years, you can really figure out um, their impact at that time. Um, what we're trying to do here at PAFA is what I call reintroducing the world to John Roden. Um, and then all the work that we do is really important for that scholarship to happen. Yeah, so um, about John Roden, this is, this is sculptor uh, John Walter Roden. Um, and the, the full sort of suite of the, the full scope of this project at PAFA um, includes a retrospective exhibition of his sculptures uh, that is accompanied by a catalog, um, taking about 10% of the work into PAFA's permanent collection, distributing the bulk of that 
collection, the rest of it, um, to museums around the country. Um, and this is part of what, um, there's also the Roden Auditorium um, is a new facility at PAFA that is named in his honor. Um, but all of this is really enabled by a lot of archival work. Um, so a little bit of background, Roden was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1916, uh, started sculpting as a young person under a local mentor, William Grant, then graduated from Parker High School in Birmingham, attended Talladega College, um, and had a chance meeting with Hale Woodruff, the art historian at, uh, the Atlanta, at Atlanta University. And he was known for starting the Atlanta Annuals, um, this invitational exhibition series um, at, the, at the AUC, at the Atlanta University Center um, that invited black artists uh, to exhibit work regularly. There was a purchase prize every year um, in a time when there weren't a lot of exhibition opportunities. Um, in the, in the South uh, during Jim Crow and beyond. Um, and so this chance meeting, uh, Rodin met uh, Dr. Woodruff as a young sculptor, a young uh, scholar. Um, he, upon Woodruff's advice, moved to New York, uh, supposedly for a visit, but essentially never left. Um, and so this was in the mid 1930s. And while he was there, uh, he met a lot of folks who are sort of celebrated figures of the Harlem Renaissance at the time. Um, Augusta Savage, the sculptor being one of them, and she introduced him to Richmond Barté, um, probably the most famous Black sculptor at the time, who ended up being Roden's mentor. Um, and so this is, I'm, to, I'm doing this very quick history of Roden's life. Um, so under Barté's mentorship, his work grew incredibly. Um, he served in World War II. After World War II, he went to Columbia University on the GI Bill, um, and while at Columbia, uh, for sculpture, he won sculpture prizes. He won a scholarship to Skowhegan, um, which is really important and formative in his career. He became the first black visual artist in residence at the American Academy in Rome. Um, he won a Guggenheim Fellowship. He won a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. Uh, he was supported by the Fulbright Foundation and really just had the kind of career that is, is a bit of a dream for um, a mid-century sculptor of any, you know, from anywhere, um, but certainly for Roden in New York in the, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and so while he was at Columbia, he met fellow art student Rashonda Phillips, um, and they eventually married and traveled the world together. And so she was with him in Rome. Um, he used the Guggenheim support and Rockefeller Foundation support uh, to travel internationally. He spent a lot of time touring the world on um, uh, supported by the U.S. State Department. Um, and so Rashonda is a huge part of his practice. She's not just his muse, she's his collaborator sometimes. So she was with him in Indonesia in the 60s. She was with him um, in Italy in the 50s. Um, there's an incredible archive of travel photos. This photo um, sort of shows them in their home and studio in Brooklyn Heights on Cranberry Street. Um, and part of what's fun about it is that it's one, a beautiful home. You can tell that these are very artistic people. The house was filled with the work that they made. Um, so these are his sculptures and her paintings. Um, she played piano. They had two pianos in this 4,000 square foot home in Brooklyn. Um, and this photo is taken for a 1966 Newsday Magazine article about their renovation of the house. Uh, which was a tour stop. It was a, on the on a walking tour of Brooklyn. And so there is a sense that even though he had this incredible exhibition history, um, that they were neighborhood folk, that people could tour their home studio and see how artists lived. And so there were audiences for their work outside of the museums and galleries uh, that he was showing in. Um, but to think about artist legacies, this is a view of the works in the home in 2017, um, after Roden had passed in 2001, and Rashad, after John and Rashonda had passed. John passed in 2001, uh, Rashonda somewhat more recently. And what do you do with artist legacy when you have all of this work in a home and, and you're trying to tell the story of their life in an exhibition form, um, and the work alone is, is not necessarily enough to do that. There weren't a lot of secondary source materials on John Roden. And so even where there were primary source materials, the work of trying to figure out how do you assemble that when there isn't an organized archive, if you want there to be an archive, 
how do you make one and who makes one um, and out of what? What information do you need um, to be able to do that? Um, and so when we talk about the road and works coming to PAFA, we don't just mean uh, 300 sculptures from you know, this incredible four story house in Brooklyn. We also mean, um, and this is, this is the, the work once it moved on site at PAFA. Um, and in the photo on the left, you're also seeing a lot of uh, what we call ephemera. This is paper, this is letters, um, awards, contracts, tax records sometimes, um, personal documents, photos, um, photo albums, old resumes, old correspondence that really tell us the story of, well, beyond sort of a close reading of what the, of, of the sculptures themselves, how do we contextualize them in space and time? Um, how do we contextualize them in terms of geography and influence and, and generation? Um, and then also, how, how do we want to talk about them in the, in the fullness of their life and, and the places that they were exhibited? Um, and so here, um, I'm showing, you know, for people who have done research in archives before, you're used to maybe seeing them look neat. This is what the work looks like uh, before you before you have the resources, um, both material, financial, um, and in terms of personnel, to assemble it into an archive. Um, and yeah. Wang, I think this is where you you this yeah. is how you met the archive. So uh, it was interesting how the, the John Rodin estate transferred um, everything, basically, the artwork. And then um, there was rumor that there was, oh, there's a couple of filing cabinets and papers and things like that. I'm like, um, yeah, we have to have that if Brittany is going to be able to, you know, organize an exhibition of retrospective because Google, you know, everyone Googles, there's just not enough information to write even one essay on this guy. Um, so we brought it down and this is very, very typical for a lot of papers and artist papers, family papers, things like that. Uh, they come in to us, you know, they're in your um, grandmom's attic, your basement, things like that in no real particular order. Um, however, you know that they cherish it because they kept it. You're talking about uh, newspaper clippings from the 50s, 60s, 70s and onwards, photography. Um, so we knew that it was a very important collection for the artists. Um, so there was a high priority um, and it gave us an opportunity for uh, applying for an NEH grant because um, we could tie it into larger humanities projects in terms of um, Brittany mentioning John Rodin traveled extensively. We're talking um, during the Cold War, uh, post-World War II. So there was a lot of uh, nation states that weren't developed yet. So um, having a glimpse into the past, that gives you another very interesting um, how do we say, this? entrance into history, uh, not even just American history, global history as well. Um, so we ended up applying for a grant, um, I believe it was 2018. And then we were fortunate that we were able to get the grant uh, to hire on our project archivist as well as assistant archivist to process and digitize and place um, all the digitized objects online as well. So we're currently working on this. However, uh, the pandemic, happen and we kind of uh, had to stop our uh, project midway. We're actually a little bit further along. We're about 75% done um, moving forward. So a lot of the processing work, a, a lot of the funds were used to hire two project archivists, supplies for rehousing, and there's a lot of effort into caring for the papers. Yeah, and I think that um, this is sort of, uh, I think it's important to show, you know, what it looks like when it's not visually stunning, um, when it is this sort of like this, when it looks like cabinets and drawers just sort of moved from a home into boxes, um, because that's how that's how it starts. This is this is what happens before you can. Um, before you even have the information to write an essay or even to write an object label um, that you want to tell the story that, that you kind of need this first. Um, and so when we did get the grant, you can see now um, this is Kellen working in the space at PAFA. Um, also, this is something that we're, we're regularly updating a blog about. So if you want to follow our progress online, um, you're welcome to do that uh, for folks who are interested in processing and what it requires. Um, but some of what what gets talked about on the blog um, and what we're really interested in is these kinds of stories in individual objects. Um, so it really, um, it was important to get to see, you know, 
John Roden's passport. That was something that once we had the passport, we could reconcile the passport and the birth certificate with other documents that had conflicting birth dates because for a while, um, we his birth date was listed as two different dates on, um, you know, across maybe 20 documents. So even being able to figure out how to write, you know, the, the line of a label with the artist's name and birth and death dates was like the in the beginning for us was a little like, Okay, so first we have to verify birth and death, um, just at a basic level. But also what's um, sort of amazing to get to look at these old passports, and there are several in the archives, um, is not just what passports looked like in the 1950s, but all the stamps from places that, um, you know, they, they don't have those checkpoints anymore, or those countries don't exist anymore, or they exist under new names now. Um, I also just really love this letter from, um, Hale Woodruff, uh, who was professor of the art department at NYU at the time to John, um, like just, just to get a sense of the relationship between these two people, Hale Woodruff is sort of a towering figure in African-American art history. And to see him write to John in this kind of tone, my dear John Roden, um, like this is really, really sort of lovely on this letterhead. And also he's writing you know, both the, the kind of like friendly relationship between them. And also, of course, I'm going to write you a recommendation letter to the Whitney Foundation, um, which is just, it's nice to see that kind of collegiality and get a sense of who he was in his time. Um, there is also, you know, this exhibition postcard that John kept, um, or that John and Rashonda kept in their home, tell us something about his exhibition history. Um, so in places where that hadn't been compiled, it's literally going through the old pamphlets, um, the old catalogs where there were catalogs, where there weren't catalogs, um, trying to find old letters, records, um, like the kinds of things that you pick up when you walk in a gallery. And then I also think it's really nice to see him in conversation with Klee and Kandinsky um, and Moreau here in this era, um, because that tells us something as well about who his contemporaries were that we know that he showed with them. Um, this is another thing that it's really lovely to find uh, in the Rodin papers. Um, he had the lease, Richmond Barté's lease to his, um, his gallery space in New York. On the left, you're looking at, um, so far, the only photo, uh, the only photos that we have of Rodin and his mentor together, um, which is something that we, we got from another archive. So even talking about collegiality, if you know that Barté was Roden's mentor and there's nothing in the artist papers that speaks to that visually, um, and you're thinking about how, how, exhibition, um, how exhibitions come together, what's compelling in a catalog essay that you wanna be able to tell that story visually, um, we've really been lucky to be able to reach out to other archives um, and get work from them. Um, and Kellen, did you want to talk a little bit about the Barté lease? Because this was kind of an exciting find for us. Yeah, so I apologize. I have a few kind of moments that I want to say before I get into the lease. Um, just a refresher, I'm Kella Baldridge, the project arch archivist um, for the Rodin Papers. I came into this project once all of the papers, those boxes that you saw on a previous slide, were already at PATFA. Um, and so I'll quickly talk about some of the broader characteristics and then we can kind of dive down into what's actually in the papers. Um, the papers, when they came to us, had little, if any, original order, uh, meaning that the papers and photographs were not organized intentionally by the creator. They were haphazardly shoved into boxes and folders. There was dust, there were dead bugs. Um, interspersed throughout the collection were letters dated after John Rodin's death. And because of this, we really had a lot of freedom um, to decide how to organize the materials. Um, in discussion with Brittany, we decided that it would be most useful to researchers to organize the materials in a way that corresponded with Rodin's resume. Um, for example, we kept materials related to exhibitions together and materials related to commissions together and so on. Um, with that said, I think this collection is organized in a way that is self-contextualizing. Um, but moving on to the papers in a more general level, archives really have the power to reveal the story of an individual or a group represented. And one of my favorite aspects of working with the archives is how they can wholly dismantle preconceived notions of the subject and this really came to pass with the Rodin papers. I know both Brittany and Wang have mentioned it 
Um, but based on John Rodin's relative modern obscurity, I came to this project with the impression that he was a lesser known community artist that was just being discovered for the first time. But from the archives, we really learned that he was a businessman, he was a self promoter and networker, and he was highly successful on an international scale. Um, many of the accolades Brittany mentioned kind of prove that to be the case. Um, and the Rodin papers really show that he was not simply handed these awards. He was actively reaching out to bigger names in the field to form connections. Um, he applied to some of these scholarships several times before he actually earned them, um, which I think just shows his resiliency. Um, he made a very active effort to achieve his success and that active effort extended beyond his artistic talent. Um, and it really included his interpersonal skills and business savvy. And that all comes to light when you look at the material in the archives. Um, so now I will get to this wonderful lease um, in talking about some of the limitations of the archives. Uh, we know that Rodin, Rodin's relationship with Richmond Barté was very important in his life and very influential in his career. But the only time Barté actually appears in the Rodin papers is in this lease from 1953. Um, it's a lease for a studio apartment in Chelsea, um, Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan. And at the time, Rodin was not actually there. He was in Rome, uh, but he had lived in this apartment and worked in this studio with Barté. Um, and this information and this relationship is not made clear within the Rodin papers, um, which could be due to the fact that the Rodins settled into their home in 1960, uh, their permanent residence. And so it was only then that the papers had the opportunity to accumulate, which is an interesting thing with archives. You have to consider that we're dealing with people's lives. So if you're moving around and very nomadic, you're likely not going to keep all of your paperwork, documents, contracts, letters. So it's an interesting thing to note and could explain some of the gaps we have. Um, and also with that in mind, it highlights how important it is to look at and work with other archives, as I know Brittany's done a lot of, um, because that's kind of the best way to get the full picture. Each one of these plays a part in the puzzle. Um, Moving on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, the archives really show that Rodin developed an impressive international network with artists and art world personalities. Um, many of the names that appear in the papers are immediately recognizable, if not just have a Wikipedia page. Um, but many of the images lack of caption. So it takes a lot of kind of visually based research to identify um, a lot of the notable people and places. Um, we have down in one corner a photo of Henry Moore, which is one interesting and notable connection that Rodin made during his time in Rome. Um, Moore visited Rodin's studio. He sent him a letter critiquing his work, encouraging him as an artist. Um, there was no caption, but I had previously worked on material with Moore, so I kind of had that base knowledge. But many other cases, we didn't have the base knowledge, so it did take a lot of the visual research. One such case in the center is Anna Beslich, a Serbian sculptor, um, and in the same vein is Asmunder Svenesen, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which was one of Jana's great identifications. And with that said, I don't think there's anyone better than Jana to talk about the visual research and kind of the detective work we've had to do with this collection. So kind of pass it on to you, Jana. Thank you, Kellen. Um, hi, I'm Jana Auerbach and I'm the assistant archivist on the Roden papers. And I was lucky enough to when I came to the collection Kellen had some of these in some very pretty boxes. So I got to see um, the collection, not in Tupperware containers. Um, but so the thing that I found most surprising about this collection was how international it was going to be. Um, Rodin did 
tons of traveling under um, um, with the with the government under um, oh what is that with um, Calum what's the word sorry. <laughs> We traveled with the State Department. Department. Yeah. Thank you. I um, haven't been in the office in a while with the State Department and he got to go um, to countries. He got to go to Russia. He got to go to countries that um, were still under um, in the Soviet Union. And he um, had taken all these pictures on these color transparency slides and they were undated and unlabeled. And if they were labeled, they would just say like Russia or Russian artist. And so what we did is we first organized them into continent and then by country. And then we sat down and really looked at almost every picture individually to identify where it was or who was in the picture. Um, that meant that I spent a lot of time in um, Google Maps and Google Street View. I was able to walk the streets of um, Moscow and Tokyo. Um, but then there were other things that were harder, like in, um, in South Korea, Seoul looks much different in, 19, in the 1950s than it does now. And so you have to look up images that are either historical or what we had was um, we would reach out to friends or colleagues to have the Korean translated for us. So we would get any, any sense. Um, one example was a picture in Japan, which is on the next slide. Yes, and so the picture on the left is the, the slide that um, we were looking for. And um, I had to go and look um, at these pictures from um, Google and Google Maps, but they were, they were different. You can see that the, um, the rocks around the, um, the stone were different. And this um, picture actually doesn't show the great Buddha. And so then what I had to do was find these historical images of this area and figure out um, if that was truly the place, because what's most important is that what we identify is, is correct. Um, so if there was a shadow of a doubt, we wouldn't be able to put that in. Um, and then with the artist, what would be really complicated was, you know, what Callum said, th there wouldn't be, we would have no idea if this person was just like a random person or someone really famous. So we would have to sleuth Wikipedia pages, lists of um, like artist clubs or groups at that time and really look um, to identify if we could see a piece of artwork in the background, if this person who was 80 looked like the same person in this picture who was maybe 32. Um, and that was, that was really interesting. I tell people all the time, I joke that it, this project's made me so much better at crossword puzzles because I know so much more about geography now um, because I've just been able to walk all of these different, um, all these different countries. And it, it has made me, um, realize like I've been able to look for, for myself and for others, for art historians, but for really any historian, now we have these images of, you know, Soviet Russia. We have images of Korea in the 50s. We have these beautiful images um, when he was in Africa, when he was in Indonesia, and it's all incredibly priceless. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that it's that it's fun to think about um, is both what the nuts and bolts of archive making um, sort of helps us to think about, um, you know, I hope that there are artists uh, with us today who are thinking about the kinds of things you save and who saves them or um, people if you're archiving your families, you know, wondering what what happens with family papers. Um, when when people try to put together the stories later, um, that like both the nuts and bolts of what are these what are these photos? How are they useful? What do what do we want to be able to say about them? Um, and also just the fact that um, Roden was somebody who assembled all of these things. Um, I think in the in the beginning at the beginning of this project, I was really daunted by trying to figure out how to find my own point of entry into. Um, just understanding when I was going through all these photos, um, when Wang and I were looking at um, 
old letters, papers, um, images, even trying to figure out what's a kind of scaffolding to even begin to try to arrange these things to understand what you're looking at when things are undated or unlabeled or the only label um, is a place um, or a gallery um, or a year. Uh, and so reaching out to other archives has been hugely helpful. Um, and even going through the catalogs, the things that he saved, his references. Um, so, you know, in thinking about Roden having this incredible exhibition track record, it meant that, okay, so Roden showed at Fisk University in 1967. You're looking at an image that, um, that we don't have, we got from the David Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland. Um, and so knowing that Roden had been in David Driscoll's landmark exhibition, Two Centuries of Black American Art, in 1976 told us um, that it was likely that there would be records related to Roden and this exhibition um, in the David in David Driscoll's papers um, or that they would be in records at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art which hosted that exhibition and so we corresponded with both of them um, that Roden showed at the Howard University Art Gallery meant that he was still in conversation with historically black colleges and universities um, and also that those institutions would have records even if they were just exhibition photos um, photos of artworks, checklists, um, that the African American Museum in Philadelphia had done a large rodent show in 1982. Um, I used to work at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, and so their artist files on rodent were hugely helpful. It gave us sort of a sense of geography and time. Um, that we could draw on what past curators had written about him for their exhibitions that stayed in files that didn't end up in public archives or in publications that we could still draw on that was um, really helpful and necessary. Um, and then getting the microfilm from the Archives of American Art at Smithsonian um, was a huge, I think, foundational get for us, um, especially in the beginning, especially new to this project, because it's one of the things that let us know that we actually weren't dealing with the story of an un unknown artist. Um, it wasn't, we weren't trying to recover someone um, who hadn't been known in art history. We were trying to tell the story of someone who, despite um, all the, despite the awards, despite the travels, despite the commissions and exhibition history, that he had fallen out of a proper understanding of art history um, as it exists in kind of, um, in textbooks and exhibition catalogs. Um, and so that was hugely important because it's the first reframe of, okay, so there's a John Roden file, um, a massive John Roden file, a significant John Roden file in the archives of American art at Smithsonian, even before we get to the information that Smithsonian has, we already know that he was on Smithsonian's radar in his lifetime. Um, and so that was the first sort of reframe of the conversation overall. Um, but it also gave us this incredible info. So we didn't have the name of this sculpture that we had on site at PAFA uh, when I first started until we'd seen this clipping of the work in the New York Times in 1969 that it had been on view at the Brooklyn Museum that year. Um, and because it's captioned, you know, that journalistic work from the 60s told us, okay, so now we have an exhibition history for this sculpture. We have a name for this sculpture. Um, it has a historical track record. Um, this work didn't come to us already cataloged with its names and dates and exhibition histories. And so being able to recover that was really important. I mean, this is the kind of information that you expect to be able to see at an institution uh, just on a basic tombstone label. Um, and we didn't have that until we had done that historical research. Um, and it also makes possible what you're seeing before you. So the so for folks who, you know, the reason that I, I love this image of all of the, the boxes on the racks um, is that because this is the condition that you need all of these papers to be organized in before you can have a researcher who can come and look at the objects to study them in an organized way to figure out how to write about them. Um, this is a researcher I won't name, but who is on this call, uh, who came to the Rodent Archive to start doing the primary source work um, to start to do the scholarly writing um, um, that we include on, on our wall text and in our catalogs. Um, and so it's lovely to be able to see, I hope that uh, artists present with us today are now thinking about, oh, what happens with all of my stuff? Like, how do I want this all to live? And, and what will people need to tell my story in the future um, to understand um, both what I'm doing and what my career looked like in real time? Um, and so with that regard, I also just wanna thank 
all of the institutions that have collaborated with us. Some of you are here. Um, part of what this is, is both a celebration and a toast to you and a reveal to the public all of the work, just how much institutional collaboration um, that you need to be able to do this kind of work that we, that we really would not be able to do the writing without. Half these institutions worked with us when we were still working on a grant application to the NEH. So it was really helpful to have that information up front to be able to say, so here's what we don't know, but what we suspect we will find. Um, and just gave us some sort of hunches to sort of flesh things out. In some cases, things that we knew might have happened but didn't have images for, now we had, um, and in some cases, the other. Um, and so I also want to um, just like show our, our contact info in case folks have other questions before I stop and open it up for conversation with everyone else. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah, thank you. Kellen and John as well. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, I just want to reiterate for anybody who joined us after the call, we'd love to hear from all of you via questions in our chat, or if you'd like to, I know we have many colleagues and I definitely see some artists on the call too. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand virtually, you can do that by clicking the participant button and virtually raising your hand or go like this, we'll find you <laughs> if, if you can't find the button, but we'd love to hear from all of you while, we, while we're here to discuss this important topic. <laughs> I also, while people kind of formulate, I wanted to know um, if that's okay, if I can jump in, but if anybody has any favorite um, things that you've found in the archives, or I know, um, Donna, you kind of talked already about some of the, the things that you've uncovered, but just like memorabilia or stories or images, um, yeah. Um, some of my other favorite stuff was I became obsessed with um, Rashonda's cats in the in the archive. It's um, John John Roden's wife. I really became obsessed with her in general, um, and but she's all these really loving pictures of her with her cat, and um, you can see like she's always had a cat throughout the years. And my goal has been like I need to figure out this cat's name. Um, and so right now, I think it's one, one of them was named Grandma Whiskers, but other than that, it, it's all a mystery to me. <laughs> we also have this uber dramatic series of letters. Um, Jana will get excited when she hears this. Um, from John to Rashonda during his time with the State Department in which Rashonda thinks that John has cheated on her and John sends just a flurry of letters. It's maybe 10 to 12 letters in a three day period. And he talks about all the wonderful things he's bought her and how he would never do that to her and keeps emphasizing how many things he has bought her. And it's just such a, you know, what would have been a really hard time for them, but looking at it, it's just this dramatic moment in their relationship, which is quite special. And to, to also add, when he's in Japan, for some reason, he's obsessed with, um, and which is when the letters appear, he's obsessed with getting her a kimono. And then later on, you see her wearing the kimono in house pictures. So it, it's really interesting to see her and be like, I'm asking everyone where I can get you a kimono. And then, and then there she has it. Yeah, I also remember thinking about, um, you know, in those letters between them, um, where you're you're sort of seeing a dramatic um, marital spat play out um, across international lines in, you know, the, the 1950s and 60s. One, just thinking about the materiality of, you know, now that would be like a flurry of text messages. Uh, but at the time, it's, you know, there's huge spaces of time that are happening in between these letters, um, which is sort of intense to think about, you know, what, what these artists are doing in these different parts of the world. Um, but we also really, like we started thinking about like the economics of, you know, when someone is saying, I, I keep buying you all of these gifts and I have bought this and this and this, even thinking about, um, I think that sent us down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out how, what the purchasing power that would have been today, um, which let us know that he was being really well compensated um, while he was abroad, which was also a new bit of information, you know, sort of beyond the emotional um, to see, oh, 
he's in a position to have quite a lot of disposable income, which means that when he's doing these gallery shows in different parts of the world and the work is for sale, it's selling really well. He's being compensated well. This isn't, you know, there's, a, there's an audience of collectors that's international um, that is putting him in a position to be able um, to be, you know, pleading with his wife about all of the things that he's purchasing for her and sending her. And the detective work that you all are doing is just so, so interesting to hear about. Um, our chat is definitely blowing up with some really great questions, but the first one I think I wanted to address is, um, we did have a question about when we could see the exhibition. Um, yes. So the exhibition is currently on our calendar um, for early 2022, uh, COVID pending. <laughs> As is everything. <laughs> and then, so we have another question, um, kind of bounce around here a little bit, but one that I think has come up, Brittany, when I've seen you give other, other talks too on the subject, um, but why do you think Mr. Roden dropped out of history? Uh, I have, I feel like I have a new, new thoughts on that every time we find new information. Um, I think, you know, in the, I think a huge part of it is not, not having a relationship with a single institution or a single gallery over a large portion of his life. Um, I, I think that this is, you know, this is a story where because there wasn't an assembled archive um, that we've really been chasing down bits of information um, all at archives all over the country. Um, and I see a few people here who are from those archives um, who have, you know, emailed with me back and forth to send me documents from various papers. Sometimes it's in, you know, the James Porter papers who um, was an art historian. Sometimes they're in the Driscoll papers. Sometimes they're in Barté's papers. These are all um, papers that are archived in different institutions um, across the country. And I think that assembly work um, might be part of it. Um, I think a lot of 20th century history of African American artists uh, doesn't exist in places where um, where you expect to find um, art history in a consolidated way. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about just the, the development of our fields, um, the art historians that we know and who they are trained by um, and what they're trained on. Um, the fact that historically black colleges and universities have done a good job of doing that kind of arts educational work, um, but that kind of intellectual work sometimes happens in classrooms and exhibitions in a way that doesn't show up in, you know, large textbooks um, or these like huge catalogs, the sort of encyclopedic views of art history. Um, and so I think we're, I think we're lucky to have a story where we have so much archival information that we're pulling together from all over the place and not necessarily having to create from scratch. Um, but it does, but it does mean that you have to pull it from all over the place. That it means, you know, being in collaboration with thirty or forty institutions, and sometimes those institutions are small galleries. Um, sometimes those institutions are neighborhood archives. Sometimes they're museum archives. Um, sometimes they're community centers. Um, sometimes they're just people who knew the artists. That it's out there and it exists, but we we just happen to be um, the the folks that were in a position to sort of pull that together. Um, which is really, you know, just just the work of a lot of people on this call. Yeah, I want to speak a little bit about that. It, it was one of the more interesting things that I found in the archives that John was traveling extensively, exhibiting, making so much art during the mid 20th century. And then when he moved back to the States, it seemed like he gravitated more to um, public commission, public art commissions, things like that, um, and really based himself as an educator. So there was a running joke about the lack of documentation from that period. He, we believed that he was, or I just believed that he was a CIA agent because he traveled so extensively moving through these communist countries in and out through these borders. Um, and then like Brittany mentioned, he was well, you know, well funded and as a black man traveling globally, um, particularly in these regions where, um, there just weren't a lot of Americans. So it, it just felt um, strange in the fact that he was, he was so well recognized, highly reward, uh, awarded and 
exhibited and then kind of uh, fell off in terms of exhibition and travel. So I don't, his passwords reveal no more travel after I believe uh, the 60s or 70s, I believe. And then a lot of his works uh, became public commissions throughout New York, uh, Alabama, um, and other Birmingham places and things like that, if I recall. So. Yeah, I mean, there are there are two large commissions in um, Pennsylvania. There's one, there's oh, yeah. a statue of Frederick <laughs> yeah. Douglass. Yeah. Down the street. <laughs> yeah, um, so there's a statue of Frederick, Frederick Douglass at Lincoln University, um, and there's a large public commission outside the African American Museum, which was commissioned for the opening. Um, and it's also, you know, we've been thinking about artist commissions and public art in this moment um, where there's a lot of conversation about public art um, and and thinking about what, um, you know, if, you, if we're looking at the paperwork about those commissions and sort of his thinking, it's also interesting to think about how long an artist um, can support themselves off the work of a large public commission. Um, and so I, you know, we've talked about what, you know, why an artist wouldn't want to have a long-term relationship with a gallery. I think that there's a sense that the Rodins wanted to have control of their own work. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, there isn't a gallery that has everything on that artist's career that's, you know, held that after they're gone. Um, but there's also something to thinking about um, these artists wanting to have complete control over their lives and careers um, and not be um, beholden to an institution to be able to make and sell work. Um, and, and what's really lovely about that is that how, how the work even came to PAFA is through a friend of the rodents, Robert Anker. Um, and so we've been in conversation with Robert Anker and Patricia Perlman, um, who were family friends for decades, um, and who also have supplied us with like great material and stories. It's like nice to have a connection to them as people. Um, but that, that that's different than if we were, you know, a museum corresponding with the gallery trying to get different records, we maybe wouldn't have the kind of the texture to the sense of them that you have with people who knew them for decades and know what it was like to be in their house and, and go to these incredible parties that they used to host that we have these great photos of um, that all of that sculpture that we showed in the photos that everyone who knew them says, no, they lived with the work. If you went over for a party, you would all be sitting around a table um, and all those sculptures would be sitting in the middle of the table. So everybody that knew them knew the work really well. It's just, it's, it's, it's all great information. Um, I want to, we have a really wonderful question in the chat. I want to make sure we address before we run out of time. And um, I think we have time for a couple more, but we have one from um, Sylvia, um, who says, thinking of this current season of time when art and protest are palpable themes in our lives, did Roden make work that at times could have been considered a form of protest and or conscious argument making for racial equity? That, that is a good question. Um, so here's, that's hard to think about. Um, I think the one of the things that I have been wanting in this archive that I don't think that anybody has come across yet is like artist journals. Um, I would love to know what he was thinking privately when he was making some of this work because I think that there's there's a way to read some of his public works. Um, So I'm sort of of two minds. Um, on the one hand, there is a tradition in the mid 20th century of public artwork by black artists that is visually um, political that like fits our sense of like a kind of like protest iconography or racial iconography that we're used to seeing. I'm thinking of, um, you know, the, there, are, there are public works all over the country that are about racial equality um, or or black power movements or public art movements that are that are intentionally community oriented and intentionally designed, you know, protest art, um, which I think is like a very valid tradition. And that's often pitted against, um, I think, abstract art, which Roden worked in abstraction a lot, um, or even the, the kind of commemorative statues that we see, these like monuments to great American figures. Um, 
And so Rodin has commissions, Rodin was commissioned to do public sculptures of Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, um, and of uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, um, the activist for the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Um, and in this moment where we're watching people sort of pull down, we're watching protesters pull down statues in public places and suggest we would like to see other, other public statues exhibited there instead, um, it's really kind of reframed some of the, I think, narrow readings of, of what it means to have a statue of Frederick Douglass um, on a historically Black college campus, what it means to have a statue of Reverend Shuttlesworth um, in a part of Birmingham where a lot of historic activism was, that that does a different kind of work than um, you know, some of the, you know, I'm thinking of like work I, the work I love, like by Elizabeth Catlett sort of figures holding up a black fist, um, that that does a particular kind of work, but it also thinking about who is commissioning these sculptures um, and what, where they will exist in public space that also feels political in a way that's easy to miss because we're used to seeing monuments and we're just sort of, if you walk by them easily, it's easy to say, oh, this is just a statue of a historic figure. Um, but, but I think that it's, the politics of that are really, really thick and important too, um, because of who they are and how they're positioned. Um, and the fact that these are figures that typically do not get public monuments in the, um, in the American public landscape. But thank you for that. That was a thick question. That's great though. Um, I, I wanna maybe end today's program with one last question that we have from Brooke. Um, and that I think just hear you talk about, you know, wanting to find his journals um, or something written, uh, I think ties in really nicely of um, asking if there's anything for any of you that you hope to find in the archives or when you started this project or now. Um, yeah. Um, I think if we're framing it as advice for artists looking to one day have an archive and have the importance, you know, like John Roden does we were really hoping for more journals, more personal expression, explanation of process, ideas, inspiration, which is one thing we haven't found that says something about John, because I think what he saved is very business oriented. Um, but I do think kind of keeping a journal, documenting kind of where your mind is as you're going through these events in your life and as you're creating your artwork would have been very helpful both to the Rodin papers and will be helpful for other artists um, who want to have a legacy someday. Kaylin, I had the awesome opportunity of working on an archive about 20 years ago and we found um, a little notebook and we didn't know what the notebook was for until we finally put the pieces together that it was actually a list of all the titles of his artwork. And it took a little while to figure it out. It was this, it's an artist, a Chicago artist by the name of Henry Darger. But it was just in our minds groundbreaking and opened up so many other doors for us. Um, and they didn't exist anywhere else. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if there's anything like that that you guys are dying to discover. You still find more, I think. I don't think you're quite done with the discoveries. Yeah, John, John made a lot of art and he made a lot of work that was untitled or figures or bull and horse and cat. So it, it's, it's difficult uh, to really navigate through that um, because he created so much. So we would love to you know, have the title, have the date. So we are p piecing that puzzle together so Brittany can have a better uh, sense of the trajectory of his art and his style because it, ha it did change. Uh, uh, different influences throughout his life and throughout his travels. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I always love thinking about um, generational cohorts and networks. Um, and so what I love in other exhibition um, and other exhibitions and exhibition catalogs, uh, PAF is really good about this because it's an art school. Um, I wish that there were just like a ton of old folk photos of Rodin with his friends in art school and um, Rodin and Roshanda's art students together. Just like there's something really romantic about that time thinking about, you know, what does it feel like to be a young artist in the 1950s in New York City 
um, making art full time and, you know, living and working in a studio with your classmates and mentors, like that's, um, it's a really formative period in an artist's life and career. Um, it's nice to get to see, I mean, there are thousands, I'm not exaggerating, thousands of travel photos of him being all over the world throughout Southeast Asia, um, all over Eastern Europe, all over um, Africa dirt before the uh, before the decolonial movements in a lot of cases and that's really nice and you get a sense in those photos that he's a fun person and that people love to be around him um, but I really wish that period right before he went to Rome in 1952 I would love to see what those photos look like um, I opened with the portraits of him taken by Carl Van Vechten in 1937. Um, for that reason, Van Vechten photographed so many major important art historical figures of the time. Um, and that's an archive that's at the Beinecke Library at Yale. Um, and so it was a, like kind of amazing to see, oh, Rodin was one of the people who was photographed too, along with people like Jeffrey Holder and Zora Neale Hurston and, um, you know, Augusta Sapp. I mean, every every major black artist, writer, performer, dancer, intellectual of that era um, has those photographs in that archive against that sort of like zebra backdrop. It's like amazing. Um, but I would love to know, so when he left that photo shoot, where was he going? Who was he hanging out with? What were the bars they were drinking at? What did it look like when they were having art parties and they were, you know, making work in the studio? How did he and Barté work together? Who were his friends that he was in classes with? That like, those archival photos where you have, um, you know, artists in a room in a circle and a model in the center and they're all making work around, you know, from the figure. Um, so much of his early work is about the figure. Like, I just, I would love to have those kinds of photos. What did it look like when they were young art students and their artistic voices were just forming? Yeah, well, I hope I hope there's more to find, like Brooke said. Um, that's really, really inspiring. Um, so we do have to wrap up our program tonight, but I, I wanted to just quickly thank all of you for being here. Thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, quick plug for Yes, and cheers and thank you all. Um, quick plug for next week's programs. Um, just because we've been talking about some of these themes already, next Thursday, our pop up course is going to be talking about Philadelphia monuments. Um, we have Paul Farber from Monument Lab talking about the removal of the Rizzo statue and what, what we do next. Um, I'll drop a link to that in just a second. Um, we also have somebody who's on the call, Amani Roach, who's going to be giving our art at noon next week, talking about black art. And so I'll, I'll uh, drop a more um, uh, more descriptive link, excuse me, in the chat in a second. But again, thank you to our wonderful archivist and curator here with us tonight. I'll let you guys say the last thing to everybody. Yeah, sign off. Um, Abby, can we also just uh, give a shout out to Robert Anker, who's on the call? Um, I know, Brittany, you wanted to do that. So if we could all just give a wave to Robert Anker, who's in the middle of my Brady Bunch screen. Um, we would not have this collection at PAFA without without Bob Anchor. So it's so nice to see you and nice to see you healthy up there in Brooklyn. Yes, thank you so much for all of your work and your stewardship and um, and your friendship. You've been a real, you've been a like a deeply, deeply valued part of this project. Unmute him. Can we unmute him? As long as we have a moment. We are, uh, Enid, whose English would say we're gobsmacked at the amount of the range of information you've come up with, because we just knew John and Roshanda as friends. I became his attorney and her attorney in 19, uh, in the 80s. And it's very interesting, Roshanda lived to be 99. So that she, she lived well past John's age. And John really was not, as, he was very verbal as a human being, but he was not a writer. So I don't think you're going to find the journals you're hoping for. But he was constantly working in terms of uh, pro production. And, and as you know, his, uh, his work was, uh, was ex extraordinary. And I'll, I'll give you one anecdote, if I might. Roshanda was particularly beautiful. And she was of Indian uh, background, American Indian background. And the best story I heard was a young, uh, young boy was at their house. Uh, and uh, Jane, are you the Jane who bought the house? Yeah, so you, you, you'd appreciate this. Uh, and 
<clears throat> what they wanted initially when I drew their wills was the house to remain as a museum, an educational museum. So it just didn't work out, but fortunately we met Papa and that was a marriage made in heaven, as uh, I've said many times, and uh, between Brittany and Brooke and David and all those wonderful people, we couldn't be happier. Uh, but apparently young man, uh, Roshanda was particularly beautiful and she was his muse and she was his model for the most part. And some youngster came in and looked at this big, beautiful nude model in copper and said to Roshanda, did you pose for that? And she said, I had better pose for that. <laughs> I better be the one he, he posed for because John was a very good looking fellow. And, uh, Pardon me. And a flirt. And a flirt of, of sorts. But they were wonderful neighbors. They were, they were terrific in the neighborhood. There was, uh, we all lived in Brooklyn Heights. And there was a fair called the Cranberry Street Fair. They lived on Cranberry Street. And they were instrumental in uh, running it, so to speak. And their house was the central point of it. So that's how we knew the rodent. So in, in listening to all of you here, we are really impressed at uh, what you have uh, been able to dig up because all we had was, was what we gave you. Uh, but Roshanda having lived to be 99, as I say, <clears throat> really didn't keep things in order, so to speak. Uh, but you have, you have no idea what it was like to walk in just to visit them and to walk into this constant museum. And anybody who walked into that building, and I think Brooke is one of them and Brittany is one of them and David is one of them, the first thing anybody said was, wow. <laughs> because all you saw was what you're going to see in the museum and elsewhere. Uh, the only thing I'm sorry you didn't show was a picture of the uh, auditorium that's been built. Uh -huh. We're very proud of that. But it's nice to see all of you and hear from all of you. And Jane, I hope things move along <laughs> at some point in life. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know you all have a Hong Kong situation. <laughs> we wondered about, Patty and I wondered about that. But anyhow, it's nice to see everybody. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. We'll yeah. sign off now. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So much. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, mute on your way out and say bye. bye. Thank you, everyone. Great job, you guys. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Bob. Good to see you. It looked, you Thank look you. Healthy. You too. You too, all of you. <laughs> Stay well. That's good news. This was so good, Abby. So many colleagues. I see all the names. <laughs> I don't want to call people out, but I'm like, oh, it's so nice to see what you look like. We've been emailing. Oh, Brittany, I call out people in culture and, and, and coffee every Friday. <laughs> I'm pretty shameless about it, actually. <laughs> um, were there a lot of archivists on the call? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of, yeah, I, I was seeing the names when people had cameras off and a few faces like, oh, that's what you look like. <laughs> Um, we saw Emily, Emily Weiner was here from Vanderbilt. That was exciting. That is, and maybe this is Patty in the iPad. I'm wondering if this is Pat. Maybe she's muted, so I don't, it's hard to know. Yeah. Well, great job. That was fantastic. That, that, that rental lease is something I'm just going to be thinking about.